Salutations and fist bumps, folks. Welcome back to The Grid. Blue Beetle for me was a fun DC superhero movie starring Jolo Monduena, which was also shot on location in Puerto Rico. Blue Beetle was also played by Will Friedle back in 2008 on the animated series for Batman the Brave and the Bold, and he appeared in 13 episodes. And the first episode was very similar to the ending of this movie. The movie opens on a snowy, icy dig site where we see Sergeant Ignacio Carapax, played by Raul Max Trujillo, who locates the Scarab. Carapax is a standing rival of the Blue Beetle and is known as Conrad Carapax in the comics and debuted in 1986 in Blue Beetle Volume 6, number one. He is met by Victoria Cord, who is played by Susan Sarandon, who is also the voice of Dr. Wong in Rick and Morty. You must be Rick. Mm-hmm. I've heard a lot about you today. Your family is crazy about you. Your daughter holds you in very high regard. You're a lucky fella. And Victoria Cord is CEO in both the comics and this movie of Cord Industries. In her first encounter on screen, we hear her mention Prometheum, which at present, Prometheum is slightly tossed around the DCU as its vibranium. However, in the comics, there are two versions of the metal alloy, both super powerful, but distinguishable in their effect. There's depleted Prometheum. It happens when the alloy is mixed with titanium and vandium. It becomes a invulnerable metal, which is what cyborgs cybernetic parts are made of. Volatile Prometheum is a little bit different. A dangerous mutagen that can mutate living beings or enhance or start their metagene. It was used to create superhuman criminals like Deathstroke and his mesh armor, sword, and staff are made wholly or in part by volatile Prometheum. And this also looks like the base of what Cord Technologies machinery is based from. And hey, if you're getting some value so far from this video and understanding a lot more of the underlying things inside of the film, go ahead and fist bump that like button for me and the subscribe button because we are on the road to a thousand subscribers and we're still climbing, so I need your help. I appreciate it. Thank you. Let's get back to it. We see the history of the scarab as it makes its way through space. As it flies, we see flashes of lights and two of them, the red and the yellow one specifically, reminded me of Superman and Wonder Woman. Although we know that we don't have a Superman inside of the DCU just yet, but one of the flashes of light is green and it actually hits the scarab and knocks it off course. This is confirmed by the director to have had a member of the Green Lantern's corpse on the other side of it, but we don't know exactly which one just yet. We then get our first glimpses of Palmera City. Heme has now returned from Gotham University where he is a pre-law student and we also see him wearing a GU sweater later on, and this is probably why his graduation cap and tassel are black and gold, because Gotham's colors are usually black and gold. And this guy is on Tinder. There's also a sign that says voted number one rated tax rate for corporations in America, which means that this city is being industrialized or has been in the past. And that's probably why Cord actually came there in the first place, which admittedly makes it harder for the Reyes family to even still stay there. We are then taken on what could be considered a city tour of Palmera City. And this is similar to something that happened in the comics where Heme actually makes a FaceTime call back to his friends in El Paso. We see a Starbucks coming soon to replace a Carnesita. Cord Industries is literally littered across the entire city with development points, which serves as a gentrification point for investors inside of the Edge Keys. And you can also see a Big Belly Burger being developed right next to the Starbucks. And in this montage, we also get a glimpse of Uncle Rudy's Cheech and Chong bobbleheads, which we get a close up on later on in the film. And a quick call out in terms of the colors inside of this movie, everything that deals with Cord Industries has a purple hue to it, which we saw earlier when we saw Victoria getting out of her helicopter and we see throughout the movie and also that takes a nod from the comics as well. While the Reyes family actually has a hue of blue, which shows up in their house walls, the roof, the actual blue beetle suit, and even the car that Uncle Rudy ends up driving. 
As Heme and his sister look from the top of their home into the night sky, you can see the Ace Building, which is the same company that produces the Joker after he falls into a vat of chemical. Harley Quinn actually ran a tanker into the industrial building with the same name. The Cord Building towers over all of them inside of Palmyra City, which is similar to what happens inside the comics as well. And beside it later on, you can see LexCorp. The two of them get a job working on the cleaning crew inside of Victoria's mansion. And for a brief moment, it seems like Heme actually lives out his dream of getting his family to financial freedom, but we find out that that is just a daydream. Get back to work, Stuart. But the song playing in the background of that daydream is a Spanish version of Blame It On The Boogie by Michael Jackson. Victoria is then shamed by her niece Jenny Cord, played by Bruna Marquinzi, after she finds out what Victoria's secret plans are. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! What, too far? Which turns out to be that she wants to revive the OMAC project. OMAC, which stands for One Man Army Corp, a drone policing system which attaches to its host similar to a symbiotic situation, directly attaching itself to the spinal column. In the DC comics, the OMAC was a Captain America type superhero from the 1970s, the first of which was Buddy Blank. Jaime's Nana is actually watching a older TV show that depicts a golden scarab. This is the golden scarab from the 90s indie horror film Kronos, whose main character was actually played by Ron Perlman, the voice of Optimus Primal. Who are you? Why are you hunting for the king? The Kronos film is actually about the scarab that gives the owner eternal life, but it comes with some drawback, which is similar to what happens to Jaime in the fact that he gets powers that he didn't have before, but at what cost? After being fired while trying to be a hero for Jenny, he takes her up on the offer to get a job at Cord. And as I mentioned before, everyone is wearing the same hue of purple that Cord is known for around Palmyra City, including Jenny, who is now holding the scarab inside of a Big Belly Burger box. Big Belly Burger is a restaurant inside of the DC Comics, which is a subsidiary of LexCorp, which gives more credence to the reason why they're even there in the first place. Now in the possession of the scarab after Jenny pawns it on him, the scarab latches to Hime's face and the display here actually reminded me of the Thriller music video. Like the initial latch reminded me of when MJ's character realizes that it's a full moon and starts contorting. When the scarab starts breaking out of his sweatshirt, it reminded me of when MJ's character was breaking out of the track jacket. And when he gets his face covered, it is directly in line to when MJ's character starts to change in both his face and his hand. During his transformation, you also hear him call out to Uncle Rudy because he is the only person in the room that is inclined to such tech. We hear a female voice who only Hime can hear, played by Becky G, as the Scarab settles into its new host. Kaji Da was created by a group called The Reach, which landed in ancient Egypt and then given mystical powers by accident, which is something that we see play out in the opening credit scene. Kaji Da actually takes Hime just outside of the Earth's atmosphere on his first flight sequence, which these flight sequences were actually made by drone footage taking off at 75 miles per hour. And you cannot hear Hime's thrusters anymore, just his voice and Kaji Da's, because there is no external sound in space. Hime's suit slices through a bus, but does not hurt anyone because they are not killers, which is something that comes up multiple times inside of this movie. This scene reminded me of Shang-Chi's bus scene because the action is very similar to it, the shot progression is also very similar to it, and it gets cut in half, but not vertically, horizontally instead. And after returning home from his first flight mission, we hear him say, you can't fly, Superman can fly. And in that moment, it sounded like a classic Peter Parker quip when he was trying to keep his powers from May. And it's presumed that this film is set inside of the DCEU, which was the original development process of this film. However, we don't see anyone from that Justice League inside of this movie and 
if that were the case, his Superman would actually be Henry Cavill. James Gunn has already said that he wants Blue Beetle to be a part of his Gods and Monsters slate, keeping in mind that this film was originally set to release on Max alongside of Batgirl. However, Batgirl is now canned completely. Michael Keaton would have been the Batman of that universe. And in The Flash, we actually started with a Ben Affleck Batman, then went to Michael Keaton, and then ended with a George Clooney Batman. And just a random theory to throw out here, we saw that George Clooney's Batman is somewhere out in the multiverse. And that means that if you remember the 90s Batman and Robin movie, Gotham was lit up like a Christmas tree in Times Square, and it is the same aesthetic inside of Palmyra City. So it possibly could stand to reason that both of these cities happen in the same universe. And I can almost definitively say that there is a Batman inside of this film's universe, and particularly inside of this film somewhere, because Uncle Rudy actually says that Batman is a fascist. So if there was no Batman, how would he actually know that? It's all very confusing. And to make everything a little bit easier, I'm just gonna place this movie inside of the DCU Limboverse. Hime then picks up Jenny and she explains the history and the reasoning behind why it chose Hime as its host. And this is one of the best moments for me inside of the film when Hime shows the scarab in his back again. You can hear his sister go, oh, oh I forgot how bad it looks. Rudy, Hime, and Jenny break into court towers. And by the way, Rudy is definitely the guy in the chair, AKA Alfred in this movie. They steal the smartwatch that used to belong to Ted Cord, and on the mantle, you can actually see Ted watch, then running into Carapax, who has now fused himself with the OMAC prototype. Kajida then takes the wheel and gives Carapax a few haymakers, even against the wishes of Hime, which then allows him not to kill Carapax because they are not killers, which actually ends up being a good idea later on. While turning on and messing with things inside of the laboratory, we hear Rudy compare Blue Beetle to Superman in Metropolis and Flash in Central City. And in the lab, we see the suits from the previous Blue Beetle eras, the Ted Cord era and the Dan Garrett era. But a seed is planted when Jenny walks up to one of the empty mannequins depicting or displaying that a suit is being used, possibly by her father, Ted Cord. The ship that they pilot later on is fairly comic accurate, if not exactly, and you might recognize it from a different character from a different universe because the Blue Beetle concept inspired Night Owl inside of the Watchmen universe. We see a snack box of Oreo cookie, which is a favorite snack of the Martian Manhunter. Though in the comics, they are also called Chacos, which is probably because of legal reasons. But this Easter egg is directly confirmed from the director to imply that Ted Cord and Manhunter have been on adventure. And the last time that we saw Manhunter was inside of a Snyder Cut Justice League film. So could this be tied to the DCEU? Nah. Hime figures out how to summon Kajida when he understands that it will not let him die. So he takes a leap of faith or desperation because he literally just heard Victoria heading to his home in the Edge Keys. And the way that the next sequence was shot with the blinding lights, the neighbors coming out of their homes, peeking out of their doors, and the huddling of the family trying to stay together, even to the point of creating a human link. This is all shot to give the emotion of what would happen in an ice raid. This was also the portion of the film where the hate for Victoria went from a six to a 12 for me. Because the fact that she even called this strike in the first place seriously made me hate her. And the fact that Alberto dies in this sequence makes it even worse. And I figured that this was going to be the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of his health situation, but it shows how stressful and anxiety inducing it is to live inside of communities like this. Hime gets distracted, allowing Victoria to use the claw. The claw. 
where he is then taken to the Cuban island fortress and locked up where his power would be drained from his body. The island is known as Pago Island, which is a location inside of DC Comics where Dan Garrett actually dies and Ted Kord takes over. During the transfer, Hime experiences his dad and that is when the fusion actually really occur. Because inside of this sequence, and it reminded me of the ancestral plane in Black Panther actually, he learns to understand and come to grips with the power of the Blue Beetle. Hime awakens and then faces off against Carapax who now has the final version Omax suit. But Hime is not alone in his fight against Victoria and Carapax because his entire family joins in on the fun. And it's actually cool to see that one of the gadgets used by the family, specifically his sister, is a Nintendo Power Glove, which came out in 1989. Oh, and by the way, a DC character by the name of Dead King actually uses a power called the Power Glove. Hime actually battles against Carapax and doing all of the losses that he has now experiences almost kills him. Kajida reminds that they are not killers, which is a similar thing that he said from earlier, stopping her doing the same. And in that moment, Kajida shows Hime the life of Carapax and how he was enslaved and brainwashed pretty much into doing what he did for Victoria. During the beginning of this battle sequence, we actually see the Buster Sword, which comes from the 1997 Final Fantasy game, Final Fantasy VII. And going back just a little bit, after Carapax shoots the roof where Rudy was standing and presumably killing him, Jaime actually has, or at least it looked like to me, a Goku Super Saiyan moment, similar to when Goku lost his friend Krillin and almost by necessity turns into a Super Saiyan, which is similar to what happens to Jaime when he was pretty much almost out of the battle. And when he says Kaji Da, it sounded like to me the same sentiment or same inflection of the Kamehameha wave from Goku. The flashback from Karapax's memories are woven with real news footage of the US military in their actions in South America. The director has said that he wanted the audience to feel and understand that Carapax's history and backstory is built on real historical events. Jaime then lets him go and Carapax decides to self-destruct with Victoria in hand along with the island. Jenny then takes over Cord Industries and pledges to rebuild the Reyes home. And Jaime and Jenny finally get that kiss that has been hinted at the entire movie. So with all of that said, where is Ted Cord now? Well, from a recent comment from the director, it is possible and stands to reason that he's stuck in time with his good friend Booster Gold, which in the comics they spend a good amount of time together and Booster Gold is already slated to get a Max TV show. Add to this that Booster Gold is also Hime's mentor in the comics. So it stands pretty much on its own that Ted Cord is probably with Booster and we'll probably will see a Blue Beetle sighting maybe inside of Booster Gold's TV show. And it has already been confirmed that Blue Beetle will show up back inside of the DCU at some point. But yet another theory could involve the Reach, who invented the Scarab and maybe Ted on his quest and his research about Kajida possibly gets in trouble with the Reach, and now he has to rectify that grievance because the director has already said that the Reach could play a part in a Blue Beetle sequel. And you probably have a whole lot more questions. Well, 